X and Pearl are two of my favorite horror films of my lifetime, so naturally I wanted to witness the closing chapter of the trilogy before anyone else had the chance to spoil the film or even share their opinions with me. And I highly recommend that you do the same, especially if you are a fan of the series thus far. So if you have not seen Maxine yet, do not watch the rest of this video, I will be spoiling it and sharing all of my first impressions, opinions, and no matter what I think of it, I think it's worthwhile that you go form your own opinion before seeking out mine. Alright, so now that it's just those of us who've seen Maxine or don't care too much about the spoilers, let's get into my thoughts on this movie. As you may have guessed from the title of this video, I was pretty disappointed by the film that I watched a few nights ago. I did not hate it by any means, but it made a lot of choices that either underwhelmed me or flat out bewildered me. Despite this film being many horror film fans' most anticipated film release of the past two years, after watching the end result, I was left with an overwhelming feeling that the film did not seem to know why it existed. Much of this video will be focusing on the issues that I had with the film that support that sentiment, but I also want to emphasize that Maxine is not a terrible film. It's just that with the strength of both X and Pearl, it was a humongous feat to try and match those two movies' freaks. But before I let the negative thoughts win, let me first talk about the successful elements of Maxine, because there are a lot of things that this film does right. Visually, the film is gorgeous, it's undeniably 80s without being stereotypical, and it sets itself apart from the first two films with its look alone, just as Pearl and X have their own unique and era-appropriate looks. Maxine feels like it has the highest budget of the trilogy, which I'm almost certain it does, and all of that budget probably went to these visuals, and it shows. For much of the film's runtime, the visuals were enough to dazzle me and had me overlooking a lot of the issues that I was having with the writing. The scene with Tabby and Maxine walking through a busy LA street at night was a visual highlight for me. It felt like they spared no expense transforming this backlot street into a vibrant, bustling, and dingy city street with so much visual character and a lot of extras and atmosphere that really immerse us into what it felt like that night for those characters. There are a lot of high points with the cinematography, and I can't wait to take all of it in again when I get the chance to rewatch the film. Shout out to the film cinematographer Elliot Rocket, who has been a DP on this entire trilogy, as well as some of Ty West's other projects. Similarly, the costumes in this film were a huge highlight. The costumes in the entire trilogy are understated yet iconic to both their respective films, but also their respective eras, and that is certainly carried over into this one. I love how some of Maxine's costumes felt like evolved versions of things she wore in X or Maxine's style in X, and there's also just so many costumes in this film in comparison to X that the costumes play a really large role in adding those new flares of personality to the character of Maxine Minx, which the script does a far worse job of doing. Marianne Seo served as costume designer on this film. Hold on, let me rephrase that. Marianne Seo served as costume designer on this film. So hats off to her and, and everybody else in the costume design team. Hair and makeup likewise is massively successful in communicating the era and giving the characters their own personal style. The head of this film's makeup department was Sarah Rubano, who also led the makeup department of both X and Pearl, as well as Avatar 2, which I found to be a very interesting piece on her very stacked resume. And of course, the prosthetics and any other special effects work in this film are definitely commendable. There's a large team of makeup artists who worked on this film, some specializing in special effects makeup and some not, and everybody on this team definitely deserves their flowers. I wouldn't say that the gore is amped up from X, but the gore that is in this film is on that level, it's just maybe not as much as you may expect. But again, the gore that is in this film looked very real and had very impactful moments that had me hiding behind my fingers. So if that's something you look for in these movies, there's definitely a handful of scenes that will satisfy that need. Another strong aspect in the film is its casting. You'll see later that I don't think much of these people were given a lot to do in the film, but nonetheless they were casted perfectly and gave the performances their all. Of course it cannot be understated how talented Mia Goth is as an actress, but also 
Giancarlo Esposito, Elizabeth Debicki, Moses Sumney, Halsey, and Kevin Bacon are more highlights in the performance department in Maxine. And as a Giallo fan, I of course loved the visual flourishes that felt straight out of Giallo films of the 70s and 80s. The way the killer was shown through close-ups of his leather gloves and the lighting and color choices specifically with those kill scenes and the blood and how the protagonist is presented as the driving force of the investigation. All of those elements definitely felt like an homage to the genre. And also the way the film ends with a shot of a decapitated prosthetic head also felt very giallo as well, perhaps even a reference to the ending of Deep Red by Dario Argento, which ends with a decapitation followed by immediately rolling credits. I will say though that the ending of Maxine did not have that same effect as those classic giallo endings that leave the audience in the heat of the moment right after a highly climactic moment, but another film in this franchise definitely does do that, and that is the ending of Pearl. Alright, with those positives said, I must now get into some of my issues that I had with the film. But remember, don't let my opinion alter yours if you had a positive experience with the film. Opinions are subjective after all, and I probably went into this film with completely different expectations than you did, and nothing about my opinion makes it more right than yours. A lot of my issues with the film come from the film feeling like it doesn't organically fit in with the two films that came before it. And that partly has to do with how this film deals with some of the overarching themes of the trilogy. Some of the themes that the trilogy seems to have set out to explore are the history of filmmaking and the history and the taboo nature of pornography and exploitation films, and more broadly how humans respond to adversity, whether it be perpetuating cycles of abuse or addiction. All of these themes are organically explored in X, and most of them have their rightful place in Pearl as well. But while these themes are present in Maxine, they feel almost shoehorned in so that they can check that box off of the list. Despite taking place on a studio lot and revolving around the production of a horror film, the film never actually lets us see much of the filmmaking process when cameras are rolling, and we never see Maxine shoot any scenes for the Puritan 2. Compare that to the hour of X's runtime that is devoted to the making of their porn film. And speaking of the pornography element, in Maxine, Maxine's past work in pornography seems to have taken a major toll on her work opportunities at the start of the film. And in the middle of the film, the director claims that the producers are trying to convince her to fire Maxine because of said past work. But at the end of the day, Maxine's talent that she showcased at her audition was enough for the director to fight for her to stay on the project, and it never seems to actually pose a real threat to Maxine's career during the film. I would have liked to have that attitude towards pornography in the 80s explored a bit more from a historical angle, and in a similar vein, while I do love the giallo flourishes in in this film, they didn't feel as organic as, say, the influences of 70s slashers in X or the influence of old Technicolor movies in Pearl. And in terms of the throughline of addiction in these films, I honestly couldn't give you an answer if you asked me what the trilogy is trying to say about addiction or substance abuse. It's something that is very prominently in the background of both X and Maxine, yet never directly addressed. Just like so much of this film, its themes get lost in a jumbled mess of excessive plotlines, each of which have little substance due to an overall lack of focus. Taking a look at the main twist and the villain of the film, to me it felt like the most obvious option if you were to make a sequel to X. The evangelical father Maxine escaped from will track her down and try to get her back. The ending scene of X easily sets this premise up, and it was such an obvious sequel setup that I thought there would be no way in hell that Maxine would actually revolve around Maxine's father tracking her down while killing all of her friends. And to put it simply, that's what this film boils down to. While I definitely expected to get more context on the father and Maxine's upbringing, based 
Only off of the trailer, I was fully expecting the film's killer to have something to do with the repercussions of the 1979 massacre that we witnessed in X, or something even more out of left field that we wouldn't even begin to have guessed. And given that this is a sequel to X, it feels really odd that those tragic events and those characters that we loved and lost in that film, they don't have any concrete repercussions in this film. But let's break the twist down a little bit to try and get to why I feel like this was such an underwhelming twist. The film opens with that home movie of Maxine inexplicably doing the Pearl Dance from her audition, which prominently features a conversation between Maxine and her father, who is behind the camera. Maxine's father, who we learn in this film is named Ernest Miller, instills a dream in Maxine that she will one day be the star preacher of the church, just as her father is currently. And Ernest instructs Maxine to deliver her mantra, and perhaps the thesis statement to the entire trilogy, I will not accept a life that I do not deserve. So immediately we are told that Maxine's childhood and her father will be playing a significant role in the film, and not long later we see the masked killer view Maxine at one of her jobs, and he is visibly angered by Maxine's performed sexuality. He is so enraged that he tears a banister off of the wall. Now who else would have such a response of pure anger at a relatively tame striptease? Surely it can't be her estranged evangelical father. These two things happening so early in the film communicated to me that the father would be a red herring, it's just too obvious. As the film goes on, Maxine gets sent a copy of the footage from RJ's camera during that fateful porn shoot in 1979, and the detective characters also push Maxine for answers about what happened that night. But at the end of the day, Maxine never divulges any information about that night to anybody in this film aside from off-screen to her agent, and again, the events that occurred in X have no real repercussions in Maxine. At the same time, despite the twist of the film boiling down to Maxine's father and her childhood, I feel like I don't actually know anything new about Maxine's childhood, or her father, that I couldn't already gather from the ending of X. And the only new thing we learn about Ernest is his name, and that he's now a full-blown serial-killing cult leader with a mansion in the hills but we aren't exactly told how he got there or who any other member of this cult is. A lot of my problems with this twist might have been afterthoughts had the confrontation between Ernest and Maxine been stronger in this film's final act. The climax of this film occurs as Maxine is tied to a tree with her mouth covered as she is forced to listen to her father's evil monologue. You heard me right, the climax of this film gives Maxine fucking minx literally nothing to do just so that a character we just met can have a monologue. I also can't say I was the biggest fan of Simon Prass' performance in this scene, and I really didn't like how the boring detective characters are the ones who save the day before they are mysteriously killed off screen. There's just a lot of uh, moments surrounding this twist that just happen off screen for some reason, and I would like to see the meat of the twist, which I feel like got edited around or just wasn't written at all. Which brings me to another significant issue I had with this film the writing of Maxine Minx. Performance-wise, Mia Goth was good. My only problem is she wasn't given nearly as much to sink her teeth into when compared to the roles that were written for her in both X and Pearl. A lot of her dialogue honestly was weighed down to me by frequent nods to memorable lines of dialogue from the first two films. At times, this started to feel like a Scream film because of how self referential it was being. I can't really think of any original lines from Maxine that can compare to the ones from the previous two movies that this one references multiple times. On second thought, I can think of one. It's uh, the line she says when she reminds the guy in the alleyway what happened to the last person who tried to kill her, and the rest of that scene, of course, is one of the film's most memorable moments. But back to Maxine's writing, in another regard, I didn't feel like too much thought was put into where she was in her life now and how she has changed in the past six years. As a viewer, I don't know if she's done anything to process the events of 1979 other than push it to the back of her mind, if I'm correct in assuming that's what we're supposed to think she did. Sure, Maxine's got new friends and a budding acting career, but other than her surroundings, Maxine seems stuck as that same Maxine we left in 1979. 
which would be fine if we even explored that a little bit, but so much of this film, Maxine is just reacting to things or being talked to. And in fact, the Maxine we see at the beginning of this film is also the same Maxine we see at the end of this film. Even after everything that happens in this film, I couldn't tell you how she as a person or a character has changed for better or for worse. In X, we learn so much about each character just by observing their conversations with each other. And in these conversations is where we see changes in those characters, and each of the main characters in X felt defined, complex even, and evolving in each moment. In Maxine, on the contrary, I don't feel like I know any of these characters, even Maxine. Sure, she's hardened and more ruthless, but we never get those character-defining moments that are so prevalent in the first two films. Speaking of the film's side characters, they are exactly that. Side characters. Each one feels like their sole purpose is to be Maxine's scene partner in whatever scene is next in the screenplay. And almost nobody gets more than two or three scenes before being killed off. Which sucks because, like I said earlier, this movie is perfectly casted. When it comes to the writing of these supporting characters, there's these two detective characters who are easily the least memorable characters, and despite being integral to Maxine's survival in the end of the film, they don't actually feel integral to the film as a whole. And if you were to cut that role out of the screenplay and maybe replaced their absence with the character that Giancarlo Esposito plays, and maybe had him save the day in the final confrontation, or flip it in a way where maybe Maxine didn't have to be tied to a tree and do nothing during that scene, but I think that would have been a significant improvement if you just simply took those two characters out and replaced their presence in those scenes with Giancarlo Esposito, because Giancarlo gives one of the film's best performances and most memorable with the little that he is given. Giancarlo Esposito plays Teddy, Maxine's agent, who is integral to defeating Kevin Bacon's character, who is a PI secretly hired by Maxine's father to track her down. But after he helps Maxine brutally murder Kevin Bacon, Teddy is inexplicably absent from the rest of the film. He's not killed off, just simply never seen or heard from again, despite seeming like a central character for the first half of the movie. Back to those two detective characters though, what are they even here for if they're not going to uncover some much-needed exposition on Maxine's childhood or her father? Again, those scenes could have been cut to focus on those stronger characters and define those relationships that are present in the film. And heck, I would have also loved more exposition on Maxine's childhood at literally any point during the film, which does not happen. Moses Sumney and Halsey, too, were given so little screen time that it was a disservice to the film, especially since these two characters were shown to be fairly close friends for Maxine, yet neither of these friendships got to be explored beyond the surface level. Also, going into this film, I didn't realize Sophie Thatcher from Yellow Jackets would be in this, so that was definitely a pleasant surprise, but unfortunately, like everyone else, she doesn't get anything to do. One memorable scene, but I know she's in another scene as well, but that's two scenes and she doesn't get killed off, just like Giancarlo Esposito, she just kind of fades into not being important to the plot. And then, just to touch on the ending of this film, to me it felt unnecessarily confusing and disjointed, thanks to it featuring a significant fantasy sequence followed by the real ending, which found Maxine in not much different of a place from where she was in the fantasy sequence that just came before it. So right before the actual ending scene of the movie, Maxine seemingly has a vision of her future, which shows her standing triumphantly above her past and enjoying the life of being a famous and well-known actress. And then the film cuts back to the confrontation between her and her father under the Hollywood sign, only to then cut to the real ending of the film after Maxine kills her father, which finds Maxine in a less distant future, still filming The Puritan 2, but she is enjoying a publicity boost after defeating her serial killer father. So the future she envisioned it seems to be all but in her hands. I think this sequence of events with Maxine's vision of her future cutting to her actual future is trying to communicate that Maxine's manifesting and self 
actualization is finally paying off, and she's finally getting the life she deserves. But the message of her not accepting a life she doesn't deserve and not letting her past get in the way of her ambitions would have been clearly communicated if they had just chosen one of these two sequences to be the ending of the film. They both communicate literally the same thing, and including them both only makes me question if I can even trust Maxine's perspective as reality. And all of that jumping back and forth in the last five minutes of this movie, between slightly different futures and the dramatic confrontation under the Hollywood sign in the last five minutes of this movie, was jarring to say the least. On another note, I love the editing choices in X and Pearl, and I would say that I loved 90% of the editing choices in Maxine as well. While there is definitely something to be said about filmmaking being a team effort, which it undoubtedly is, I mean these, the credits of this movie went on for forever it felt like, as they should, it is also interesting when a film was written, directed, and edited by the same person, because it gives that person the final say of how the screenplay will be communicated in the final product. And for the most part, this is the case for this entire trilogy. Ty West served as the director on all three, the sole writer of both X and Maxine, but the co-writer of Pearl with Mia Goth. Similarly, he was the sole editor on both Pearl and Maxine, but was the co-editor of X, with a man by the name of David Kishevarov. Apologies if that was mispronounced. But in all three films, for the most part, you never really notice the editing until you're meant to, which is exactly how editing should be done. So for instance, the stylistic editing choices like the interspersed transitions or split screens that you see in X are the things you're supposed to notice, and for the most part, the rest of the first two films flow with great pacing and timing, and that's due to just having solid invisible editing in addition to those occasional stylistic editing choices. In Maxine, the editing is far from being the film's main issue, and for the most part I can't blame the editing for the film's pacing issues, which it does have in my opinion, but one editing choice that I did dislike was something that happened in the middle of the film, as Maxine begins to notice the pattern of her friends mentioning a party at a house in the Hollywood Hills, and then that friend ending up murdered. This is something that we, the audience, has already pieced together by the time the second person mentioned the house in the hills. It's not subtle, yet the film then decides to show us those conversations again, flashing back to all three different instances of characters saying that they're going to a party in the hills, and then it proceeds to cut to each of those characters' dead bodies, except for Lily Collins' character since she was going to the house that very night. So why did the film decide to break the flow of the scene by flashing back to those scenes extensively, some of which only occurred minutes ago, do they really not trust us to be suspicious of the house on the hills after verbally telling us about it three times at this point? And even if you weren't paying super close attention, the film confirms the suspicion to Maxine just a few minutes later when she stumbles into a suitcase containing the body of Lily Collins' character, which was placed right in front of a spiral staircase for dramatic effect, I suppose. This editing choice is not uncommon in film and television, and every time it happens, it annoys me just because it feels like the filmmaker is holding our hand and walking us through every little step of their twist. When 9 times out of 10, it's already been made abundantly clear at that point what they're trying to tell us. As the film went on, I felt it might be losing its way, and I found myself wondering if the film needed to exist in the first place as a sequel. Surely, my lukewarm thoughts on this film in comparison to my shining praises that I have for X and Pearl make me want to say that, no, this film did not need to exist. If you don't know, 2022's Pearl was conceived by Ty West and Mia Goth during the production of X, and the pair co-wrote that film's script while shooting X, and they convinced the studio to let them produce the prequel with a back-to-back -back shooting schedule, directly after X, using mostly the same sets. So the birth of Pearl came from the pair creating their own backstory for this murderous and haunting character they were bringing to life in X, and to them, that story justified the runtime of an entire film. And it shows in Pearl, because for the most part, that movie only adds to X and gives the character much more depth than she was given in X on the surface. So naturally, we would expect Maxine to do the same for Maxine's character, yet Maxine was not written in the same way as Pearl or with any comparable insight into Maxine or her backstory. 
and it also doesn't feel like the filmmakers had the same drive or desire to tell Maxine's story as they did to tell Pearl's. To me, it felt like Pearl was done so quickly after X because there was a lot of creative energy around the project between the pair and they wanted to communicate and release the film as quickly as possible and it felt organic. Especially given the context that both X and Pearl were filmed right when films were beginning productions again during COVID. But with Maxine, it feels like because of how quickly Pearl came after X, they needed the third one to come just as quickly after Pearl in order to keep the fan base's attention or something. And obviously, there's been two strikes in the past year, so I think if that didn't happen, Maxine probably would have come out last year. But anyway, I just think that making Maxine so quickly was a business decision when making Pearl so quickly was a creative decision, and I think it shows in the final product. In an interview that Ty West did recently with Variety, he said that he began writing Maxine while Pearl was in post-production with the hopes of jumping right into filming Maxine right after Pearl had wrapped post-production, which he says is exactly what they did. And I think that rushed writing process is to blame for a lot of these issues. In one of my update videos on the movie, I mistakenly said that Maxine was going to be co-written by Mia Goth just as Pearl was, but that is unfortunately not the case, and I think this rushed writing deadline was likely to blame for Mia Goth not being able to write on the film. But if they weren't thinking of this as a business decision and more of a creative decision, I would have given them a lot more time to work on the script and get both voices in the final product so that Maxine could be explored as a character and the film could have been as strong as the first two were. Side note though, I didn't just pull that out of thin air, it was actually Deadline that originally mistakenly claimed that the film would feature Mia Goth's writing. That being said, I definitely wish that Mia Goth could have lent her voice to the script. So maybe it's too early to tell, but I'm going out on a limb and saying that Maxine did not prove to me why it needed to be made, but this is the slasher subgenre, and almost no slasher sequel has justification to be made. Some of my favorite horror sequels have no right to exist from a story standpoint, but as much as I wanted it to be, Maxine is not one of my favorite horror sequels, but maybe that's okay. The back-to-back -back delivery of both X and Pearl unfortunately gave the trilogy unreasonably high expectations, but with the July 4th release date and the comparatively large marketing campaign that A24 is giving Maxine, this third entry seems to be on track to be the most successful entry of the trilogy at the box office, which, which admittedly the first two films had some pretty humble box office returns. But if Maxine was necessary for this series to fully break through to the mainstream and bring more eyes to the much more fantastic first two films, then maybe Maxine was worth it when we look at the bigger picture. But of course, I still envision a world where Maxine came out maybe in two years from now and they actually perfected the script and this trilogy could have ended up being one of the strongest in horror history. In conclusion, I didn't hate Maxine. It was a perfectly fun and entertaining slasher film with impeccable style and visual flourish, but as a sequel to one of my favorite films, X, it did miss the mark for me and it criminally did not build on the character of Maxine Minx in the ways that I expected. I can't wait to watch it again and I hope my opinions change for the better because honestly my opinions on X definitely did improve from the first time I watched it to the second time, so you never know how I may end up feeling when this film is less hot off the presses. Be sure to keep the conversation going in the comments. What did you love about Maxine? What left you wanting more? And I will see you next time.